everyone, and welcome to another delightful episode of The Atheist Experience. I am your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is the indefatigable Martin Wagner. I am being indefatigable right here, as you All see. Right. Today is Sunday, August 30th. We are a live calling internet atheist show based in Austin, Texas. The Atheist Experience is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can find out more by visiting www.atheistcommunity.org. And when you do, be sure to check out the fact page for answers to frequently asked questions that we receive on the show. This show is live on Ustream.com every Sunday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Central Time. If you're just watching clips on the show, of the show on the internet, then you're missing out. To watch us live, uh, please visit the official Atheist Experience website, www.atheistexperience.com. Uh, click on live stream at the top of the page. Uh, sorry, yeah, there's atheist a, yeah. hyphen experience. Although I did try atheistexperience.com and found that it redirects. I think we pay for both, possibly. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can also participate in a chat room during the show, as I'm sure that many people are doing right now. Hello, chatters. Hi there. Also on the website, you'll find audio and video from past episodes. If you click on the archive link, you will find a list of programs that includes more links to both audio and video downloads, as well as a rapidly updated po audio podcast. You can catch fan-selected clips of the Atheist Experience on YouTube, and you can also see full episodes of the show at blip.tv, or you can subscribe to our audio podcast. In addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. Visit www.nonprofitsradio.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, for more information. The next episode will be aired next week on Saturday, September 5th. Weekly meetings for the Atheist Community of Austin are hosted at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road from 11.30 to 1 every Sunday except for the first Sunday of the month, usually, when we host our lecture series at the Austin History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. Uh, the next lecture will uh, unusually be held on the second Sunday of the month. That's September 13th. The lecture will feature Kathy Miller, who will be uh, talking on the subject of the Texas State Board of Education, dragging our schools into the culture wars. Yeah, and Kathy Miller heads up the Texas Freedom Network. Who All right. Been, yeah, doing an amazing job. An uh, excellent organization. Keeping tabs on what the fundagelical... You know, majority on the State Board of Education have been doing crazy stuff. What, what was the yeah. crazy thing that they were doing recently? Well, now they it's, the battle over evolution has sort of subsided, and now the big battle is in social studies classes. Oh, that's right. They yeah. said they wanted to uh, ratchet up the emphasis on uh, conservative politicians. Right. Isn't well, what, that it? well, what they want to do straight up is just use uh, Sunday uh, social studies classes to push this whole America is a Christian nation right, uh, right. Myth thing, and they've hired uh, you know uh, frauds like David Barton of Wall Builders. Uh, and I love uh, David Barton because I mean, yeah. like any time you see uh, quotes from the founding fathers allegedly proving that they meant that America was a Christian nation, nine times out of ten you can trace that quote back to David Barton and no further. Yeah, <laughs> Not back to the Founding father Fathers, just back to something that David Barton pulled out of his ass. Yeah, he's done a lot of fabricating of Founding Father quotes and what have you. And um, so it's this again, the, the State Board of Education will not stop uh, you know, with, uh, nope. with this. It's crazy. So, so uh, don't miss that lecture. Yeah, that'll be worth seeing. Uh, if you can't make it to the morning meetings, you can always join us for dinner right after this here program, That's if you're in Austin, uh, beginning at around 6.30 every Sunday. Most of the people involved, uh, there's a small handful of people now, uh, but uh, most of us will be going to uh, Plucker's Wing Bar in North Austin, which is near the fabulous, spacious Dillahunty International Studios Dilla where we Hunty are right International now. International Studios! Um... The address of that is 11066 Pecan P 
Park Boulevard, and it's near Lakeline Mall. And Ooh. so uh, come hang out with us. Uh, around 6.30 today. Oh. Finally, the ACA also hosts an Atheist Happy Hour every Thursday beginning at around 7 p.m. Last I heard, this week's Happy Hour will, as usual, be at the Dog and Duck Pub, even though there's been some juggling lately. Uh, and that's located at the corner of 17th and Guadalupe. If you'd like to get in touch with us but don't feel like calling in, you can email us at tv at atheist-community.org. Uh, now, until we get back into the public access studio, we will be relying on your Skype calls to keep this show moving forward. And uh, I don't think we have an official topic today, so uh, we'd like to get Skype calls coming on in. Uh, basically, the way you do that is that you sign up uh, for Skype uh, you do not call us, but you add, uh, what is it, Atheist TV? Atheist TV. Is that with two T's or one? It's with two. Yeah. Okay, Atheist TV, all one word. You add us to, uh, to your contact list, and then you uh, send a message to Atheist TV. Um, and then Frank will decide which of you is worthy to speak mm. with us today. Frank holds the power. We do have a couple of calls lined up already. Uh, be sure to check out the unofficial show blog at the Atheist Experience uh, dot dot com right. site, uh, where Martin has made his first post in a long time. No, it's <laughs> just been. Uh, I've needed a break, folks. I've needed to decompress, yeah, but I'll be busy oh, in. Poor Martin. I know. I'll be busy in September, though. Definitely. Yeah. So lots I going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I keep messing that up. Okay, Frank is now. actually doing the hard work of keeping us broadcasting. Matt Dillahunty, who's our usual host, will be uh, screening your calls. And, um, right you know, so yeah. suck up to him, not Frank. <laughs> Um, I'm staying out of this discussion yeah. completely. Yeah. Special announcements. Uh, September 26th uh, is the date of the 2009 ACA Bat Cruise, Woo! which I uh, confused everybody last month by saying was coming up in August. Uh, you didn't miss it. It's still Christmas morning. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever we atheists would say. Some of us celebrate Christmas. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, you can still sign up for the ACA Bat Cruise on September 26th. Uh, and the Texas Free Thought Convention is coming up. You can check that out at, I believe, texasfreethoughtconvention.com. And that's all. Um, how, how's it going, Martin? Uh, it's going well with me, Russell. Okay. Think, yeah. Uh, and I guess we want to launch right into callers, right? Yeah, let's talk to the people. Okay, uh, then we've got... Somebody in Queens. <laughs> uh, Sid, seems like. Yeah. Oh, it's Sid, right. Sid in Queens is first. Uh, yes. Uh, hello? Hi. Hello. You're on. <coughs> oh. Hi. Uh, no, my name is Caesar. Oh, C uh, Caesar. Okay. My email name. Uh, well, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. yes. We can hear you great. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, I um, want to apologize if I'm a little bit nervous. So, oh, that's uh, all know. right. Uh, okay. You're you're just going out to a bunch of idiot atheists on the internet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what wonderful! We love our fans, and we love us, and <laughs> we love atheists. Uh, yeah, um, I'm a terrible that's PR that's one person. Of the why I call because uh, I have no atheist friends to debate with. So okay, you know, okay, I try it out here, and this is my third time calling. Okay, and. Um, Actually, I like to talk about a subject that I'm kind of surprised isn't talked about often in your show, which is the the near death experience. Okay. All right. Yeah, and um, the near death experience is something like a hobby of mine. I really know about on it a lot. You know, just you know, nothing serious. So I know a bit about it. I'm not I'm not an expert though, but I find it uh, utterly fascinating because um, I've heard. The skeptics saying, you know, that it's really just the uh, the brain going through like a dying process, uh, chemicals, or um, you know, the brain's going haywire and it's making you hallucinate at the time of death. And mm -hmm. um, and actually, I can't. Sorry, uh, no one can actually. I can't say yes or no. That's what's really happening. But the but when I look at the uh, at the actual experience. It kind of points to uh, a direction where that's not what's happening at all. That it's not has nothing to do with the brain or any material explanation in you know in that way. 
Can you and give that's it, what I would like to talk about. Can you give an example of one of these experiences and what about it makes you think that it's got nothing to do with your brain get, getting a little wonky? Yeah, there's so many, but uh, like the most... I don't know if it's the most famous one. It's the one with uh, Howard Storm. I don't know if you heard of the guy. Storm? Mm, nope. Howard Storm. Yeah, right. he's uh, he used to be a professor um, of art. I forgot which uh, university. But um, I've seen him being interviewed several times, so I know his particular uh, ND experience pretty well. And he was a hardcore atheist, uh, the kind of like you guys. You know, he's a... Uh, very intellectual, but he's not. He doesn't go out of his way, you know, to, to, you know, debate atheism or like theists or whatever. But if somebody comes up to him and um, talk about atheism, theism, he's totally uh, an atheist. So you know, t totally does not believe in God or religion. And um, he had an experience, and his experience, his near-death experience, totally changed his life, and he gave up his. Uh, his, uh, he was an art professor, he gave that up, and uh, he became um, a minister, or, or I think a minister of some sort, I'm not 100% sure on what, but can we talk about that? Sure. Well, okay. I mean, in as much as neither of us really are familiar with Howard Storm, I don't really know that we can, until we read up on him and, and, yeah. and study him a little bit, we can't really respond to what you know we think about his particular experience. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I wouldn't want to launch into something blind. I mean, I, I am certainly aware that people go from being atheists to being theists all the time, just like people go from being theists to being atheists, or they go from Christians to being Jews, or whatever. Um... Uh, one person's changing their mind, while interesting in itself, uh, is like an anecdote. And oh, okay, um, yeah. I see. Yeah, uh, when you know, actually, uh, about the near death experience, um, mm -hmm. most atheists, and I wish I had the figures, but uh, I'm talking about percentages here. Like over 95 percent of atheists who have the near death experience all of a sudden become theists. They're, they're no longer atheists. Well, you know, over 98% so <laughs> of statistics are made up on the spot, you know, so I don't know exactly Yeah, I mean, if you, ha if you had an from. actual study to point out, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, point well, explaining, yeah. uh, explaining how they selected their sample set, then we might have something to discuss. But, I mean, obviously we can't really talk about... Some, something random thrown out like 95% that we have no way of verifying. Okay. Well, I, that's an educated guess. I mean, I don't have the exact... Wait, wait is it a guess? guess? An educated guess? I thought well, you yeah, said... I mean, like, when yeah. I read up on these things, every every uh, NDE case involving an atheist, he becomes... Uh, he converts to... Well, I mean, of course, when you read a story about it, it usually involves an atheist having a near-death experience and changing his mind, because a story where, like... An atheist was near death and then experienced something weird and then wasn't convinced by it doesn't tend to get written down or noticed by anybody. Yeah, and a lot of these sources that you might be reading and, and, and until, you know, uh, without knowing exactly what they are, but I suspect that you have been reading a lot of sources that might be websites, they might be books, and these are probably written by people who are in what you might call the paranormal community or something. They're, they're believers in these kinds of phenomenons. And so they're phenomena, excuse me. And so they're usually going to, it's in their interests. The, the converting the skeptic uh, theme is prevalent in a lot of stories about whether it's ghosts or UFOs or the Loch Ness Monster or this or that. You frequently find stories being told about, oh, and, and you, sometimes people will just say this themselves, like, I was a total unbeliever until this happened to me, and now I've changed. These are very, very frequent themes that come up in these kinds of stories. So because we hear it so often and because we know it's part of the sales pitch for these beliefs, um, you know, we tend to be very you know, skeptical about that sort of thing. And uh, also, you know, knowing that near-death experience uh, is a phenomenon that has been studied, and in fact, the the actual experience of what is reported to be going on during an NDE, such as you know going down the tunnel of light and having you know feeling disconnected from your body, etc., 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 these feelings have been artificially induced, okay, by stimulating the brain. 
right? <clears throat> I mean, it's well, you know, uh, there are, uh, no, that's so we can, something it, we can talk about. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's um, been done. It's kind of known to be some sort of, you know, brain phenomenon, right? right? Also, another thing that this illustrates is basically that, uh, that a lot of times conversions happen under emotional duress. I mean... Frequently, when when uh, a question that we get thrown at us frequently is, why did you become an atheist? Did some big major traumatic event happen to you? And usually the conversion from theism to atheism happens over a long period of time with a long period of, of self-reflection because there's no like sudden emotional flash that happens. Uh, when somebody has a very uh, tr when when somebody has a very sudden traumatic emotional experience, that's the time when you're least likely to get accurate information out of uh, out of that person. So I mean, even if a hundred percent of the people who converted um, uh, who experienced these things wound up converting. It wouldn't actually demonstrate that they were right. Yeah, that, that there was some real phenomenon going on. You'd have to test it. You'd have to come find some way to test it, kind of independently, and and you'll base your results not just on, oh well, this happened to me and it changed my life. All that proves is that something <coughs> happened to a group of people, and their response to it was they changed their ways. Right. But but we still don't know exactly what it was that happened. It also, could just be a brain chemistry phenomenon, or it could be some sort of external phenomenon also that yet we I'd can't be determine. Curious to know if all of them like converted to Christianity. I mean, if you experience this in a predominantly Hindu country, yeah. do you suddenly have this revelation like, oh wait, this Jesus guy that I heard once a really long time ago yeah. uh, is, is the answer? I know that now from the thing, uh, you know, from this experience I just had. Yeah. Do people have NDEs and then become Zoroastrians you know <laughs> uh, it's 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 very interesting that no matter where you find conversion stories taking place it usually tends to be a conversion to stroke of luck what just happens to be the majority religion of that culture anyway so you know. well that's not surprising I mean you're gonna go to uh, to a religion that might be more comforting to you but mm -hmm. The thing but, is, is that. But this is the point. This is the point. Let me th that, if you were to say have a record of this kind of phenomenon taking place, let's say some sort of primitive tribal culture out in you know, darkest Africa or the Australian outback or someplace like that, right, where these are primitive peoples who have never had any exposure whatsoever to say the Bible or Christian teachings. Right, someone who has never in his entire life had that kind of experience, uh, that kind of religious education, that background. He experiences some sort of NDE or some kind of phenomenon and suddenly becomes a believer in Jesus, even though there's absolutely nothing in his culture... I think it would be really hard to screen out w how much contamination. I mean, you yeah, know, but I'm, I'm how giving much just sort exposure of exposure they ha actually. But have. I'm giving kind of a general example of if 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 this sort of thing were to happen, where you would have a Christian conversion in a place where you would not be likely to have that sort of thing happen anyway, you know, in the first place, then that might be an interesting phenomenon to study. You know. Okay, hmm. and you know what, guys? Yeah. Actually, and I can. I can only really talk about the Western experiences, like in America, in Canada. Oh, of right. course. Right. Um, yeah. I don't have much knowledge about uh, Eastern ex near-death experiences, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But what I can say about most Americans who have uh, the near-death experience, even people who don't believe in God or Jesus, um, they will meet God or Jesus. Uh, so, so people who don't believe in Jesus, they tend not to meet him. Not often, but they do definitely tend to meet God, which is about like uh, I think about twenty-seven percent of people who have it and the experience. Where are these? Where are these numbers coming yeah, from? Yeah, I mean, it's, a minute it's, ago it's, you threw out the number ninety-five percent, and then a couple mm -hmm. second moments later you said that it was just a guess. I mean, and now it's twenty-seven. Where is this twenty-seven percent coming from? Yes, yeah, so you have to. Uh, there, well, there should be studies to to you know that exist if you're if you're starting to list figures. Right. Yeah, they are. It's uh, I can cite my source. Mm -hmm. Um, it's on the, it's a website. I mean, uh, do you actually want the address to go and? 
go ahead and take I'd a look at it. I'd be curious about what the address is, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Or right. at, at least the... Uh, but, but wherever it is, <laughs> see, you, you read something on a website, right? Mm-hmm. I think the immediate thing to do, if you want to make sure you're getting accurate information, is take that and now look at other sources, not just other websites, but maybe books that have been published, studies that have been done. Check out if this website that you're reading now has got is in full possession of the facts. Well, know, the because just saying, well, I have a website as my source, that, that's n- sometimes not necessarily good enough. Okay, and the sure. website is neardeath.com. You could just Google it, you'll find it right away. Yeah, um, I'm sure yeah, that's one without an uh, agenda. Oh, yeah, I would like to talk about the actual experience. A lot of time it's being taken up, and we haven't even gotten to the experience. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you five minutes to go over the experience, and then I think we have to move on to other callers. Okay, um, yeah. five minutes. All right, um, like many people, not, anyone, not everybody meets God or Jesus in every NDE. But uh, the, the interesting thing is that most Americans, even people who are atheists, you will agree that in their culture, they know about God and Jesus, about Christianity, they know about Satan, you know, the devil. It's all in the Bible. Even though they don't believe in it, they have knowledge about it, right? Yes, mm-hmm. that's part of the and, point. Yeah. And then you might say, well, even if an atheist has an NDE experience, um, his brain might go back into that. Since he knows he's dying, the brain might have some sort of emergency software where it runs into it, it makes you hallucinate a dying experience I don't know why it would do that but let's say that's what it does right right I've, I've so. been informed uh, just now that uh, astronauts uh, experience near-death experience something like a near-death experience in uh, training well all they do is they experience the light in the tunnel they don't experience like 90 percent of the other stuff like meeting of the, the relatives Gaining knowledge, uh, out of body experience. Well, how do you know they don't? Minutes, have you I seen this? Continue. Huh? How do you know they don't? Have you seen this? I read so many accounts that um, I mean, I don't know. Mm, yeah. I, um, I must have, I must have read dozens, hundreds of uh, accounts, and right. I just. I just, well, see, I, I know. see, see here's, here's why the near-death experience phenomenon, I think, is appealing to people. And here's why I think that there are so many accounts that you've read, and uh, all of which seem to be pooling similar information and what have you. It is part of human nature, okay? It's part of our hardwired survival instinct. We don't want to die, all right? We, we uh, if, if there's one thing that the human race has been looking for, you know, ever since we got up on all fours, it's a cure for death. And if we can't have the cure for death, then we want the next best thing, which is we want to know that when you die, you really don't. That has been at the core of all, of so much of what religion has been doing for 10,000 years and more. And now you have these sort of non-religious, but still sort of quote-unquote spiritual concepts of life after death, which uh, you find reported in, say, you know, near-death experiences, or by these television psychics who tell you that, you know, you, they can contact your dead <coughs> grandfather or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that what you're reading and why all of these reports are so prevalent has a lot to do with this cultural uh, phenomenon that, that has uh, that has the same thing that has inspired religion for so many years. Well, I agree with you, yeah. but I'd like to give Caesar a couple minutes at least uh, to, sure. to go over yeah. the experience That's what I'm saying is that we need... Y- w- w- but w- uh, the point that I was simply making is that you're reading accounts, and these are called anecdotal evidence, and anecdotes, unfortunately, aren't considered good evidence, mainly because there's no way you can say, all right, let's take that and let's test it, and let's see if it works over and over again the same way, see if we can confirm that response. And right. yeah, yes, so it has so. been tested, but uh, I agree. Can, mm-hmm. we, can you give me at least maybe two minutes to finish up? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So, so let's take a tip. So, like, an, an many atheists have this experience, and they might meet God, they might meet Jesus, or they might, might not. But there's there's something really interesting, though. The, the people who are who have this NDE in America, in the West. They believe in God and Jesus. They also believe in the devil because he's like the the uh, uh, the arch enemy of God or whatever. He's like the the bad guy. You know, everybody everybody who believes in God tends to believe in the devil too. And the interesting thing is, is that in the near death experience, uh, nobody ever met the devil. He does not exist. He never shows up. Even people who have hellish and the experience who go to hell, they never meet the devil. Nobody, any entity that they 
encounter in hell never says, I'm the devil, I'm Satan. It never happened. And that's just one of the things that makes me, it makes me kind of suspicious of saying, you know, this is really just a fantasy of a dying brain. Why isn't the brain fantasizing? Why doesn't it bring up the the Satan, the all important arch enemy of God? He never shows up ever. That's because an interesting point. Most people who believe that stuff think they're going to have it. No, no, no. Just people, the way it people is. People have hellish <laughs> experience, really bad ones, where they get they're thrown to hell, and they might meet. Well, they usually meet or like shadow people, and they might meet some sort of creatures, but they're more human. They're not. There's no, and then nobody ever meets devil, uh, demons with horns and pitchforks in a tail. Almost, not, almost never happens. You usually just meet shadow people or people that are like, you know, you can't really tell what they are. But, and Satan is never encountered. And the reason why is because some people, when they actually talk to God in this in these near death experience, when the, when the few people who actually met God, they. They ask about Satan, and God simply says he doesn't exist. Oh, okay, so you're bringing this up because you don't believe in hell. No, I do believe in hell. Hell is, hell is real. People do go to hell. Okay. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that hell is not, and another <coughs> thing about that, many people think hell is forever. Actually, it's not. In, in every in the experience, okay, people want to hell. Now you're just saying stuff that you have no reason to know. Yeah, we're, no, no, we're no, getting into I'm a whole other thread of the conversation. I'm talking here. about the actual experience of people, the, right. the eyewitness testimony of these people who mm -hmm. went through this stuff. Is yeah. coming. I'm getting information from them. I'm not making right. it up. Okay. Now, why? Well, we. Go I mean, ahead. I think we ought to move on to another call. Yeah, though. but my my just my parting question for you would be: What reason do we have to think that these? Uh, experiences that these people are reporting are anything other than a dreams, b hallucinations, c you know the the brain doing crazy things, or d just stories that are being told in order in order to further some kind of and reinforce uh, existing beliefs. All right. You know, one is Satan. Basically, every, most people believe in Satan. He they never met the guy. Nobody ever met him. There's other right. things too. Reincarnation. Many Christians don't believe in reincarnation. Guess what? They're told. You do reincarnate, and you actually reincarnate quite often. Three, there's probably, uh, you ask a question to God, you always answer it to you, like, or to the angels, like, or whatever you want to call them. Is there life on other planets? They always say yes. And they say, uh, are there uh, intelligent life? They say yes, but then they say that uh, it's, not, it's not as common. Uh, usually the stuff. I want to know, know, I I mean, like, know uh, Tuesday's Mega Ball numbers. That's what I want. That's uh, what I would see, ask. And you see that, the, the, yeah. that, that kind of stuff, like yeah. the, the money and the materialistic thing. The thing is that that's totally not important. I mean, people are not sent to well, Earth. All I you're mean, telling us, though, is that uh, during these near-death experiences, people have near-death experiences which closely match the culture that they're in. They match their expectation. Yeah, but you're not, not telling. I mean, if there is a supernatural, one way that you could test it is to have have them come up with something really novel and unusual, like the Powerball like, numbers like the or something thing, less right? self-serving. Mm -hmm. But we the, really the do have to. Is yeah. very unusual. Isn't it? Matt. I mean, most people believe he's real, and the people. Are I, I don't think it's all that unusual. We're gonna move on yeah. now. Uh, We're done, but I'm just gonna say, you know, thanks a lot for your time, but in your call. Exactly. But I think it's not that unusual that people aren't reporting meeting Satan because most people who die. I mean, mo most people who believe in that sort of thing, even if they're, oh, I'm not the best Christian in the world, but they don't believe that that's where they're going. Well, so, yeah. Also, so hell is something that happens to other people. <laughs> Uh, while Matt is queuing up the next caller. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, um, you notice that when you have a, a psychic, you know, somebody who talks to people who are dead, in the great beyond, like, you know, um, uh, that, that quack... Uh, Sil J Sylvia? John Brown? Edwards. John Edward? Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> when, they, uh, when they ask, well, my father's dead, where is he? He never says... <laughs> <laughs> Your father's in hell. He's yeah. in great pain. And by the way, he hates you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You always hear these, you know, answers that are warm and fuzzy and loving yes, right. and, and uh, you okay. know reassuring. It's uh, that's really all that's uh, all that's going and on. If we if we get around to it, I'd like to take some time to talk about like concepts of primary sources. Yeah. But uh, I I think we should get to the next caller, okay. who is uh, Kenji in Kenji. Gaines, Gainesville. Oh hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we hear you great. Hey Kenji. Okay. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous. This is my first time ever calling in. I've listened to you guys for a while though. You're awesome. Oh, um, thanks. 
Um, but yeah, I'm a non-theist myself. I don't believe in religion or anything like that. But I, I don't like the term atheist. Um, for for one reason mainly. Um, are you familiar with uh, the philosophy of dialectical materialism? Um, operate yeah. under the assumption that we yeah. don't remember it. Okay, right. <laughs> and basically, okay, sorry. Um, it says you know there's a thesis, there's an amp antithesis, um, right, okay. and together they make a synthesis. Basically, someone puts forth an argument, whatever it is, and um, I guess in this case it would be the existence of a god, okay. and then someone else comes up with an antithesis, there is no god, and together they kind of, you know, go forward and it both legitimize the other, um, the religious side, you know, they give legitimacy to the atheists in that they're always opposing them, and he does the same thing conversely with um, the, the the atheists obviously opposing religion. Now the problem I see with that is atheism then is actually you know granting some legitimacy to religion because it's opposing it. Now, Wait, it, it, oh, in sorry. what way? I mean, if if you have a guy who says uh, we never landed on the moon, and you have another guy who said yes we did, does that yeah. legitimize the idea? I mean, does a contradiction automatically make one side credible? Well, no, but what I'm talking more about is, um, at the same time, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, wouldn't call myself an a-Santa Clausist. I would. I think the yeah. idea of Santa Claus is well, so you're making, you're making a good point. You're making a, a similar point that uh, Sam Harris made uh, in a speech, I think, when it was it to the... Was it the Atheist Alliance International? It was some major convention. It was either American Atheists, their annual thing, or one of the big conventions. He came out and made essentially the same point that you did, um, that we don't have a word for people who don't believe in fairies, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a word for people who don't believe in Santa Claus. You don't say you're an a-Santa Clausist, right? So uh, what? And, and then he proceeded to go ahead and make the argument that... Uh, what we need to get society to our culture to a point of uh, is is where a term like atheist is no longer needed simply because <laughs> simply by virtue of belief in god you know but people coming to this realization that it's really no more sensible than belief in santa claus or fairies or right. pixies and so uh and he i think made a similar point to that uh which you're making which is to say that the mere fact that atheism uh, exists as a philosophical position that the label is even there tends to give at least a certain degree uh, of validity, not validity in terms of oh well maybe they're, maybe these theists have something going on, but it, it, it is taking the position of theism more seriously than it deserves to be taken. Right. Like, you know, if somebody says, well I believe in fairies and there goes one now, right, you wouldn't take that person seriously enough mm -hmm. to, you know, mount huge arguments about, well, here's why you're wrong about the fairies. But atheism is unwittingly giving theism, I guess, more cred than it should get. Is is Ma what Martin's saying kind of an accurate summary of what you're getting at? Right, yeah. Okay. Well, here's why I don't agree with that. I, I mean, I, I can understand the position, and in some cases I might be inclined to agree with it, the problem is, I think, that theism already has a certain escape velocity, if you will, level of, uh, of credibility. Um, when you have, like, 85% of the country, or 80%, or, or whatever it is, declaring themselves Christians, you'd, in a sense, you don't need atheism to lend them credibility. I mean, there's a certain mentality of the same thing that your mother told you for dealing with bullies, which is ignore them and they'll go away. Um, but they don't go away. I mean, I've got a story right here uh, that I brought today about something happening in Kentucky. And, I mean, you know, this is just an example of the kind of thing that we see on the show every single week. Yeah. Where... Um, uh, the, a judge said that what a judge said that Kentucky can't legislate dependence on God. Uh, it says uh, this. The article says it is one thing to trust in God, but quite another to be ordered to rely on protection from above during national emergencies. A judge has ruled. Franklin Circuit uh, Judge Thomas Wingate said in Wednesday's decision that references to a dependence on Almighty God in the law that created the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security is akin to establishing a religion. Now. When you have states all over the place, and even the United States government 
passing laws that mandate some kind of acknowledgement of a supreme being then you're beyond the realm of fairies. I mean, it's true that we don't believe in God, but we do believe in theists. And our main concern here uh, is being able to uh, to basically get along in a society that is 85% theist. Um, and for the most part, I like theists fine. I get along with pe with people I meet, and I even get into conversations like, "Oh, I do this, you know, funny TV show about being an atheist," and they're like, "Huh, that's interesting." And then sometimes we have a discussion about it, and we don't wind up agreeing, but we don't wind up fighting each other. Those mm -hmm. people aren't a problem. The people who are a problem are the people in Kentucky who are passing these or laws. Or the people on the Texas State Board of who Education. Who are mandating uh, yeah. that my kid has to uh, has to uh, respectfully observe prayer in in his school. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, and and I think that to to believe that if you ignore that kind of thing and it'll go away is a little bit naive. It just yeah. just in my humble opinion. Yes, yeah, because Sam Harris. Uh, <laughs> Ironically, in one of his earlier books, uh, made a point that I think tends to refute the point that he was trying to make in that speech that I just discussed, which is that in theists, or in, even in really, really devout Christians, for example, what you have is a person who, on the one hand, if you were to tell him something really nutty, like, hey, if you drink Mountain Dew, you'll turn invisible, or you know, if you walk around with a terrier on your head, you'll be cured of headaches, right? You tell them, make claims like that to them, and they'll be as skeptical as you or I or anybody else, right? <laughs> I'd like to see that, right? But yeah. when it comes to this specific thing, their religious beliefs, their Christianity, their belief in God, Jesus, what have you, they elect to disengage that little critical part of their brain, which is this sort of selective, well, I won't question that. So, in a sense, theism... I think in its, you can't really ignore it, as Russell has pointed out, because unlike belief in fairies, belief in Santa Claus, which is, is, is a thing that we say, okay, it's a kid's thing, that's fine. Um, belief in most other you know, mythological beings or phenomena, theism is woven into our culture so thoroughly that it kind of has to be dealt with, especially when it starts uh, infecting you know, public policy and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, over to you. Okay. Yeah, um, that, I guess that pretty much sums up that issue. Um, do we have time? I have one more thing I wanted to get to real fast, if that's sure. Okay. Otherwise, I mean, yeah. other callers are... Yeah. Are we good? Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I wanted... To, I'm, I'm a uh, university student, um, and I actually ran into a group of Christians who had a very, a very um, underhanded, sort of devious way of proselytizing. So, I mean, they have all these... Let's say it you know, isn't so. Yeah, <laughs> knock me over with a feather. <laughs> like, you, know, all these, you know, like, they have, like, booths in, like, this uh, plaza area with, like, different organizations on campus and stuff. And I, I was just looking around to see, you know, what kind of organizations I might like to join. And they had one, it was just, um, it was just, like, an acronym. They didn't, like, say what it was. So, as I started talking to the guys, like, yeah, we do all these, like, events and stuff. It's, you can meet new students. It's really cool. You know, why don't you come out? We have a... And we have, we're playing like some games and I'm watching a movie, that sort of thing. So, you know, I figured, hey, what the hell, I'll come along and see what it's like. And I get there and it's like, oh, it's a Christian group. They didn't advertise it as such. It was like prayer and they're like trying to get me into like a Bible study small group and like all kinds of, it's like false advertising. And it's, uh, you know, it is false advertising and more than that, it's what cults do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm I'm not saying that that group was a cult, but you, uh, I mean, you know, but you have to be concerned about a group uh, that can't come straight out and say, you know, I can at least respect someone who would say, hi, I'd like you to join this group where we tell you all about the love of Jesus. I mean, you know, that's at <laughs> least straightforward. But what a cult does is often like drag you in on false pretenses like would you like to learn a way to make money in your spare time or uh, or uh you know i have this wonderful men's support group that you might be interested in and then you get there and then they're telling you about aliens from xenu or no wait xenu is the alien but you know <laughs> yeah it's so hard to keep track of this um, yeah. you think that's a bad story when i was in junior high school Okay, so we're talking, you know, sixth through eighth grade kids, right? 
and a guy came to the school and did his motivational speaking thing in the auditorium uh. which entertained everybody all the kids so much and he just had them rolling in the aisles and laughing and once he had gotten them all excited and worked up and everything say well hey you know tonight over at xx church we're going to be doing this again so come on over and at that point it was just hardline christian proselytizing all the way and there was nothing i mean it was just as sleazy as any sort of used car you know bait and switch sales thing that you'd ever uh, experience and this is everywhere right there's something dirty feeling about that sort of bait and switch and uh like it's incredibly dishonest and sleazy (laughs) yes right um I mean, I don't think that all churches do it, but I think that the prevalence of it is something that should cause an honest Christian to give pause and and take a long, hard look at what he really believes is the right way to approach people. But, uh, okay. Kenji, we appreciate it, but we're going to go ahead and go on to the next guy. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Uh, and next we've got Steve in Marina Del Rey. Yes. Steve? Hi. How you doing? We're good. Hi. Hi, I was calling. Um, I first wanted to say that I really uh, watch the show a lot and I enjoy it. I'm not an atheist, but I just wanted to express that. And I wanted to talk about, I've recently been reading The God Delusion um, by Richard Dawkins. Okay. I'm sure you've both read that. Yes. Yeah, Um, and you may need to turn your speakers down on your computer just a tad because you're feeling back. Sure. He can't turn his speakers down, uh, but yeah. A little bit. Okay, anyway, you're reading The God Delusion. Yeah, okay. and what I, wanted, I wanted to read it just, you know, out of interest to see what I had to say. A lot of my friends have read it. And the chapter I want to talk about was the chapter he outlines what he thinks is his best argument for the reason he says there's certainly no God. Mm, okay. And it's called the Ultimate 747 chapter, Ultimate Boeing 747 argument. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, and I, the argument, I think, could be sort of broken down simply into who created God, is, is basically what he's saying, that, it, that if you're saying um, God created everything that there is, that there has to be a creator, then who created God? And then whoever created God would have to be more complex than God. Yeah, I think that's actually fairly common, that, that a theistic argument will run, well, you can't explain such and such without invoking a God. And, and the usual atheist reaction would be like, wait a minute, God isn't an explanation, it's just something you made up. How do you explain that in the same terms? So yeah, right, that, but the, the, that is kind of similar. The argument, but the problem that I see in that argument is that the same type of argument could be made um, if you took an, a naturalist worldview and said, "How do you, you know, how was how did life start? How how did everything begin?" And you said, "Well, uh, who created the beginning of life?" and and it would sort of run into a similar problem. Well, that that is Dawkins' point, right? Dawkins, uh, in in this passage, is responding to that particular, uh, um, you know, position that theists take, which is um, that uh, you know, if uh, he, as he says right here, um, you know, Fred Hoyle's uh, image of the fl- the the, se- the Boeing seven forty seven in the scrapyard. It's the whole idea of just all of these um, um, metallic parts coming together to form a plane. And, uh, and and this is why uh, apparently he 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 thinks uh, naturalistic explanations are are inadequate, right. um, and so Dawkins' uh, point is in response to that, which is to say, well, you could essentially make the same criticism about a god, right? I mean, where would a god have come from, and what process would have uh, I- involved uh, you know his coming into being? And so I think why I think wouldn't it have the, the same problem? Point, I think the point of making that kind of argument is not so much that anybody's claiming that science understands everything, because it doesn't, that yeah. it has an explanation for everything, because it doesn't. It's, it's actually a counter to the religious position that rather than investigating something scientifically, we should just jump to the conclusion that there is... An unexplainable thing, which uh, which explains everything, uh, and and that wraps everything up in a nice, neat little package. The problem with that is that if you're going to invent it because you're you need everything to have an explanation before it can be set before you can be satisfied, 
It's a cop-out to come up with a god, which, after all, is not really all that abstract. It's a very specific thing based on human experiences. It's, an intel it's a human-like intelligence, but infinitely more complicated. Science generally reasons from the complex to the simple, so it tries to break things down. Uh, I mean, you know, in order to qualify as an explanation, it has to actually make things more understandable, whereas throwing in a god makes, uh, you know, is really just making up an even bigger mystery. Um, because, See, I, I mean, after all, I, I, intelligence yeah. is really the most complicated thing that we know about in the universe. So to say oh, well, we'll explain everything in the universe by making up an intelligence is just reasoning completely backwards. But I see it. You just said that everything is, is top down. So, but, the, right. but his viewpoint, the naturalist viewpoint, is bottom up. In what way? It, the naturalist viewpoint would be that every, there's no creator and they can't explain how life first came into exist, existence or how, or not even life, but how, why there's something instead of nothing and that everything evolved from... from little bacteria up right so but we know that point. life does exist you agree with that right yeah i agree with that <laughs> okay. but i'm just saying so, it's sort of the i see the the naturalist the completely naturalist viewpoint as being a bottom-up theory of of starting out with simple life and becoming more complex rather well, than exactly having, but that's because we we've, we've reasoned backwards towards the simpler life i mean we we have this world that's already in evidence we know that this complex stuff exists and the way that we explain it is by investigating proximate causes uh yeah which, which i guess are what i'm saying is though more, that i see more understanding um, the point that dawkins is trying to make but i also feel like the the flaw that he's trying to you know say how well who created god that you could sort of look at the opposite argument and see a similar flaw in, well, how did everything start? What, you know, what was behind that? So I think that... But as Dawkins well, points out uh, in the passage, uh, the whole 747 in the junkyard argument uh, is based on a very common misunderstanding that a lot of creationist theists have about how processes like evolution work. Uh, you know, they think, for example, there's a common misunderstanding is that evolution is just this complete random chance exercise where, oh, you, you know, you throw a whole bunch of uh, nuts and bolts and rivets into a tornado and voila, you get an airplane out the end. But that's not in any way an accurate analogy for how in biology evolution by natural selection works and anybody who thinks it does and then tries to make a criticism of some you know, naturalistic scientific theories based on that is uh, you know uh, really kind of talking out of his hat because he's making a criticism based on uh, ignorance of the actual science. Let me try putting this another way. We we have two things that potentially need explaining. We have God, and mm -hmm. we have stuff. Okay, and by stuff I mean <coughs> the natural universe, everything that exists. Yeah. Now, an atheist. Uh, does not necessarily claim to have an explanation for stuff, <laughs> okay? Uh, I mean, you know, there are a lot of explanations for certain kinds of stuff, um, but there are limits to our knowledge, as both theists and atheists know, and so there's going to be a certain amount of stuff that's unexplained. Now, a theist, uh, an atheist doesn't have to explain that stuff exists. He doesn't have to demonstrate it because you already believe in stuff, right? Right. You're saying, though, that not only is there stuff, but also there's this other thing we've never seen before, which is a god. And I don't have an explanation for that. <laughs> Right, but, but the, my, I, I mean, an, an atheist has that, less to explain, basically. Well, unless you think that God is an explanation for the stuff, but then it would, but then you would, even if you think that God is an explanation for the stuff, you have no reason to believe in God for the first place. In the first place, and you have a much bigger problem now, which is explaining the God in addition to explaining the stuff. Yeah, well, I'm going to say an argument, and I know that this is going to this is a popular argument that's kind of laughed at. But okay. I, I guess what I'll try to do is we'll, is we'll refrain. pick pick a, okay pick apart the the common criticisms I hear, and I understand them somewhat. But the whole idea of um, you know, I guess it's analogous to the watchmaker argument of everything needing a creator, and I understand that that gets you to a point where you say, well, who created that and who created that, but 
I'm not sure that's a valid enough um, rebuttal of, of, of the principle that everything needs a creator. Well, because does everything you could need also go back and then say, well, if everything that we observe needs a creator, then how could in the beginning, how could, how did, how did the first life start? How did, how did the first thing start? How did, what I'm saying is that they're both arguments run into certain problems, but I don't think it's enough to sort of dismiss one offhand. Well, the obvious problem, is, of course, with you know everything needs a creator is is immediately that uh, that has to apply to the creator, because if it, if you're not going to apply that standard to the creator, the creator needing a creator, and then the cre the creator's creator needing a creator, etc., 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 you're stuck with kind of the special what's called the special pleading fallacy, which is well, here's my explanation that doesn't have to obey the inviolable rule that is inviolable for everything else in order to explain its existence. And in addition to the special pleading fallacy, you're now having to deal with the issue of infinite regress back, you know, between, you know, creators and super creators and going back to infinity. But my exact point is that, and, that I, and I understand and that. And so a lot of theologians and, and, and an apologists uh, do their best to now try to avoid getting into that trap. Well, I understand your criticism, but my exact point, what you said about infinite regress, is that that same criticism could apply to a naturalist point of view, yet well, well, one of them has to be right. But you it can was look at a made up point first to apply to a naturalist point of view. The whole point of the watchmaker argument was to was to make an argument that a god is required. But my point isn't that there must not be a god. It's that inserting a god doesn't explain anything. It doesn't solve the problem that it purports to solve. I'm not really trying to, I mean, you know, I don't think Dawkins is even bringing this up to prove that there's no god. He's just saying that the arguments that there must be a god sort of refute themselves, if you catch... Well, I mean, I mean he, he, call, he says that's why there's almost certainly no god. That's what he, that's what his okay. the chapter says. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's one part yeah. among many, actually. I, I, and I think another uh, problem that... Uh, why this is a problem yeah. in, in, in these kinds of debates and arguments is I think that theists almost always come from uh, what I call a primacy of non-existence metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Which is to see, which is that... That's a big word, boys and girls. I, I, yeah, I said it all by myself, too. Uh, which is to say that they take the view that uh, before everything there was nothing. And, and we eventually, and, and at some point we came from a state of nothingness to a state of somethingness, which is the universe. And uh, I, as an atheist, don't really take that particular approach. I have what I call primacy of existence metaphysics, which is I take existence itself to be what you would call a causal primary, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to prove that existence exists, right? Because here we are, yeah. right? Uh, so now if you want to take that and, and say, well, it's not that the universe came from somewhere or that before there was a universe there was nothing, but in to, if you define the universe as the set of everything that exists, Mm -hmm. And I know I'm ignoring, you know, popular, you know, hypotheses like alternate universes and, you know, wormholes and what have you. But uh, if you take, if you want to define the universe as the set of all that we know exists, say, and yeah. prior to the Big Bang, we don't really know what there was. We don't even know if, if time itself existed. If, if the universe was a singularity prior to the Big Bang, then time itself would not necessarily have existed. Um, then... The universe, how, okay, how you can that, see the universe has understand. always, in a sense, been here in some form. Existence has always existed. The Big Bang was simply describes the event that caused the universe to expand into the form that it's in now. But prior to that, what can we say about, you know, the form that the universe was in? But using Occam's razor, what's, you know, what is the more parsimonious explanation? That existence exists and has always done so, or at one point it didn't, and something else, some magical thing on another plane, mm -hmm. made it exist by an act of will for reasons that we can't really know anything about, etc., etc. You know, the, it, the theistic primacy of non-existence metaphysics, I think, violates Occam's razor in that it unnecessarily, you know, adds... A, what it complicates or adds uh, elements unnecessarily, I think, is is how you put it. Anyway, Russell, you're pondering. Well, well I, come I on, am I full of crap or what? <laughs> um, no, I don't think you're full of crap. Why? Thank uh, you. I I think that there's a lot of speculation flying around here, and I I think uh, I think we would agree uh, if the question was 
is it conceivable that a god exists but we would not agree that that a god either has to exist or explains anything uh, in a better way than science does well okay personally do you believe that a god is as unlikely as like the tooth fairy uh at least yes okay so so in a way you don't want to commit yourself to saying i absolutely don't believe it but in a way it's it's the same thing in a way, sure. Well, yeah, I wouldn't absolutely commit to a I position. I mean, I don't no. absolutely disbelieve in the tooth fairy. I just right, but that's why I drew that unlikely. comparison, to show that right. the, your belief yeah. is, is on that level of that so low that it's yeah might as well be non, non-belief. Yes, yeah. and sure. yeah. but it's not only because God is unnecessary that I don't believe in a God. Uh-huh. I mean, I guess the, the thing is I see and other people see God as an answer to questions and you're just saying it raises more questions yeah my whole point is that as an answer it doesn't work if you want to believe in god for personal reasons then you know more power to you and enjoy but i mean the point of dawkins ultimate 747 is just to say that uh as a solution to naughty philosophical problems it's a cop-out yeah i understand what you're saying i don't agree but i I understand so thank you okay well, thanks for calling. I mean, it yeah, was we an appreciate interesting it. discussion. Yeah. Okay. No, Thank you. Uh, sure, and call back any time. Okay. Yeah. Now, I was just basically giving one example of a way that you could avoid saying, "Oh, well, the, you know, the 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 whole problem can be applied to the atheistic position, atheistic position as to the theistic position of well, where did X come from and the infinite regress issue." Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's um, how I avoid infinite. Reg- how do you avoid infinite regress? <laughs> I use double coupons and. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. You get to that silly point in the afternoon. I'm um, I mean, personally, I think yeah. that the first cause is self-refuting because first it says uh, everything has a cause, and then it says, and here's this thing that doesn't have a cause. Right. Yes. Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, really underlying the first cause exper- uh, argument is an actual belief that there are things without causes. And once you, and if you're starting from that point anyway, then there's no point in assuming that the, fir- that, the co- that the thing without a cause is anything like what people call a god. Yeah, I mean, why can't it just be the universe? Right. That is the thing without a cause. Okay, uh, next we have Phil, Phil in, New, in York New York City. Hey, guys. Hey, Phil. What's up? Uh, nothing, just hanging. Just doing a show on Sunday. A- am I supposed to hear myself? What? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you're doing fine. Just make sure that uh, your speakers can't be heard through your microphones. In fact, it's a good tip for everybody that you that wearing headphones and not having speakers would be best. Yeah. Yeah, I got a headset. Okay. Well, anyways, I think I'm good. So, you mentioned a lot of speculation I was hanging around. So let's just. I assume all that to get to these two questions that I have real quick, all okay. right? Oh, God thing. Sure. Okay. So, my reason is that I don't hear Christians ask these two questions. The first is real quick, and that is how do they know God is not Satan and vice versa? And That's somebody true. actually mentioned in the chat room. That's one. Mm-hmm. And two's a little longer. So, two goes like this. The- say that God is free will and he's unable to sin for whatever reason. And you no, know, if you put aside the good argument God is all knowing then he cannot have free will. And that, you know, he's unable to sin for reason. If you accept all that, then the question is why did he create humans with the same free will but without the inability to sin? So didn't we choose to love him freely with our free will, but still have that inability to, to, to sin. Well, I mean, I have another angle on that question, actually, which is presumably in heaven, people will stop sinning and just love God. Do, um, w- do those arguments no longer apply once you're dead and in heaven? I mean, yeah, you know, is there free will in do heaven? people stop having free will because all they do is what makes God happy? Actually, heard in, in some person, some, some theist said that there is no free will in heaven or hell. It's just because God is there. Well, that sucks. I don't want to go there during during the living time. Right. Well, then I have to wonder what the point is and why why heaven is heavenly if there's you know no free agency there. And and if you have no free will, I mean, if you are in in essence stripped of 
um, the essence of something that makes you human, then in what sense is it really you in heaven instead of just some robot going around who looks like you and says some things that you might have said? But, I mean, you know, if he has no free will, how how will it be me? I'm, I'm not I mean, comforted I, by the idea that there will be an, an automaton I'm replica of I'm me. That if God has free will and he's unable to... Why don't we have the same? We have free will, like he does. Uh, yeah. Supposedly, but well, I think Christians would come at, back at you with the. Um, they they would say, "Oh well, because of the fall, right? We were that way, but then there was the fall. Because of the fall, then but the you fall know. was sinning. But we had the ability to sin even." Yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that you should expect logic and consistency from these responses. It's just that's probably what that's, you'll get. That's why I never hear these answers. Yeah. I, mean, I, want, I, I but I what I find funny hear. about this this whole point that you bring up, Steve, is that uh, if one thing that yeah. I, I forever hear Christians say, right, when it, especially when you want to get into arguments about things like the problem of evil, and oh, well, why didn't God stop that little girl from being raped, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? They always want to come back uh, with something like, oh, well, God can't interfere with our free will. Right? Exactly. He, he can't he stop the rapist the because the rapist yeah. has to be why free to do have that. The yeah, and and if God interfered with our free will, we'd all just be a bunch of mindless robots. And God doesn't want mindless robots. But if there's no free will in heaven, apparently He does. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like what? what it, 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 uh, this is a testing uh, ground to see you if you're worthy question. of becoming a mindless robot. That's that must be it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure you're getting my question though. Okay. Uh, well, you are kind of cutting in and out a little bit on your mic, so just to let you I'm know. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, it is. The, it is the say we have free will, and therefore that explains the sin. Mm -hmm. I'm asking if we have free will, like God, does, why don't we also have His inability to sin? That's the question. Uh, ask a Christian. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we yeah, think that's a I, good point. I can't rationalize that for you. And and you should ask Christians that question, and and let us know what answers you get because. It would be interesting to see yeah, how maybe they... Yeah, you can ask them a yeah. bigger, bigger audience. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, some, if yeah. a theist is watching us right now, if a Christian is watching us and wants to call and, and answer that question, then but by all means, please do. Sure, call in. I mean, uh, I don't mention this all the time, but if you are a Christian, I uh, encourage the call screeners to fast-track you to the front. Or a Muslim, for that matter. Or, or you know, so a believer of some sort who would like to disagree in some way. Right. That n I'm not that no... I'm going to be off. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Also, regarding the how do you know God isn't Satan, I uh, have mentioned a couple times that I took a playwriting class as an undergrad, and the play that I wrote was something that I had bouncing around my head, which was one of these college street preachers turned out to be ushering in the Antichrist. Uh, you know, a, somebody who is, in their own eyes, a true believer. <laughs> Um, I, you know, is actually committing the ultimate evil and and helping that. Along. And is he doing Unwi it unknowingly, unwittingly? But, okay, but the yeah. guy who comes along also comes across as a, you know, he says, "Hey, I'm a believer just like you." <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> well, you should dig that play up, or is it one uh, of these old? It's on my website. Uh, oh, but, oh, uh, all right then. Uh, it, it's ApolloWebWorks.com slash Russell. But anyway. You can find it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we should challenge next? our viewers. So whoever does the best YouTube version of Russell's play. <laughs> oh, uh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, this would be horrible. No, this is that's it. The, the challenge of the gauntlet is thrown, people. <laughs> find Russell's play at ApolloWebWorks.com. Whoever does the best YouTube version of it, we will showcase uh, it. <laughs> Oh, no. You walked right into that one, dude. No, I, I'm afraid I did. Okay, well, we have Winston on the line, and we would like to talk to him now. Thank Winston you. Winston in Sydney, Australia. How are you, I'm Winston? No, I'm in Hong Kong now. Oh, oh. Yeah. wow, even better. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I'm envious. Yeah, before I get to my topic, I'd like to encourage anyone who wants to buy an apologetics book to try and find an old one on Amazon or eBay for a dollar or less. That way, you hardly give any money to the actual ministries. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. If you are inclined to buy apologetics books. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'd like to talk about Australia's Office of Film and Literature Classification and their retarded censorship policies. I don't know if you've got my email where I um, 
where I outline the points that I plan to talk about, but I'd like to I'd like to talk about some recent developments and court decisions, and then I'd like um, I'd like to ask your opinions on what you think about them. Is that all right? Sure thing. If I just keep in mind, we we have no expertise we, on Australian we law. We get anything, like a hundred emails a week, oh, so we no might worry, have gotten I'll your email. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm right, sorry, I'll, I'll explain it in layman's terms, but right, okay. We've banned twice as many games as the next country on the list, which is Brazil. Which and games are so banned? Or I mean, for example, uh, for example, um, Postal One and t uh, and Two. Yeah. Um, singles flirt up your life. Uh, the reason they cite is sexuality and nudity in relation to incentives and re rewards. And what they don't understand is that every violent game pretty much glorifies violence by saying that if you if you're violent, you'll win the game. So I don't really see that dif the difference. But one of the reasons they cite in allowing violence is the context changes everything according to them. And to me, the context is like building a bomb shelter out of styrofoam. Because if it's violent, then it's going to traumatize a child no matter what the context is. So are, are you saying... Um, in Let's clarify what your position on all of this is. Are, are you in disagreement with these game bans, or do yes, you th are, are you are you uh, are you essentially saying that uh, well, if they're going to ban these, they might as well ban all the rest uh, because their rationale is is not sensible, and and should they, are, is it your position that they should just not ban any of them? I mean, I, I get the impression that you you think it's wrong for them to have banned these in the first place, yeah. And then you think right. that they're and then you think that their reasons are stupid on top of that. Yeah. It's, okay. Um, All right. Um, it's insane, I think. Yeah, because number one, it's inconsistent and hypocritical, and number two, they're victimless crimes in the first place, and they don't increase violence; they reduce violence by well, generating tax revenue for one thing, creating jobs, and relieving stress, which is always better than the alternative. The alternative. By the way, I have not played Postal, but from what I've heard of it, I think it probably sucked, and I would not enjoy it. But yeah, uh, oh yeah, they, they should have allowed you to kill senses in that game. <laughs> but I, I have played and enjoyed recently uh, Grand Theft Auto 4, which I'm guessing is probably another one that they banned. Is it? Um, it was censored for sexual violence. Oh, and, for um, the sex, but not for indiscriminately killing people all the time, which is most of what you do in that game. <laughs> exactly, and they don't like shooting. Um, they don't didn't like the hot coffee incident where you shot a, yeah, yeah. a prostitute. <laughs> all right. uh, I don't think you shot anyway, a prostitute uh, in yeah. hot coffee. They just showed a little more skin then. Uh, yeah, I mean well, you could shoot a prostitute at any time in that game. Right, yeah, you can shoot anyone anywhere. Yeah, but. The thing about context is that it can be ignored. I mean, a pedophile can masturbate over a sex education chapter because they have drawings <laughs> of a four-year-old, a ten-year-old, a twelve-year-old, and a sixteen-year-old. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no way that you can legislate away crazy. And sure, a lot of these overreaching censorship laws, I think, rather naively try to do that. And so, like, well, if we just and 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 they mistakenly, um, f you know, th they want to find an easy scapegoat for some you know, for horrible violence in culture or society or what have you, and they go, "Ooh, well, there's this nasty video game, and nobody likes these, so we'll ban these, and then <laughs> the 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 voters will see what a wonderful moralist I am, and they'll reelect me." At the same time, That's I wouldn't completely <laughs> rule out the idea that some games, by the way, they're structured encourage crazy while i'm not in a fan of censorship in any yeah. form i think you know well i think an argument can be it, made it that you know, manhunt 2 probably doesn't have a whole lot of redeeming social value but yeah um i think there it's you know the 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 question becomes all right are you stable <laughs> enough to distinguish fantasy from reality and know if, however tasteless this might be that you're playing a game uh, then and and right, at that but, point, uh, I mean, and also a uh, culture tends to develop around some multiplayer games. Uh, yeah. you but, know, but buttons. You, I don't know. Yeah, I, but the World of Warcrafts out there and the stuff like that that's out there that that are really really popular, they're not as beyond the pale as you know Manhunt Two, right? That's in true. terms of you know, you tend to when you when a culture an online culture develops in in that sort of uh, situation, 
doesn't it kind of become this like self-policing sort of not necessarily not it really can, it <laughs> can be or is everybody just crazy it can be self-escalating like an angry mob i mean it uh, it really depends that's when it gets fun i guess no <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> but yeah. anyway because yeah, i don't do on. the more bigger things so yeah I, I, I don't know i've got a lot more and it gets a lot more steamy and worse so please oh, bear with me um even though they thank games for using sex as an incentive Guess what is completely legal and regulated in Australia? I'll give you half of a guess. Uh, tentacle porn? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> prostitution. Oh, okay. Hmm, okay. Uh, okay. So it seems wow. that the cultural mores that we've inherited are very... Uh, they just, so they just you don't can, make any sense. So you can pay for sex, but yeah. you can't pay to have fake sex. Like you, can't, you can't simulate it on a video game, but you can you pay can, for the You can thing. have phone sex 69 cents per 9 seconds. That's huh. real learning boarding school, but <laughs> you're not allowed to... Well, we don't have an R rating for games. It only goes up to MA, and the problem with that is um, a lot of games that really should have an R rating are rated MA, and some 15-year-olds are really shocked because well, you know, the rating on the front of the cover doesn't tell you about anything other than the violence. To me, this just suggests that there are a bunch of old people who don't understand the medium, and the solution to that would be to wait for them to die. <laughs> uh, I wish, but I, I come up with a theory about their, their sensitive rules regarding porn. The only thing that makes sense to me is, verily I say to thee, if Voldemort and or half of our censorship board get aroused, by the material, it is deemed unfit for adult consumption because it offends the standards of a reasonable adult. But I think most adults would be more offended that they're wasting time prosecuting these victimless crimes. I mean, last December, someone was fined $3,000 for having pictures of Bart and Lisa Simpson having sex. And the judge <laughs> said that even though they don't look exactly like human beings, well, they are human beings, and therefore they have human rights. Uh, well, that thanks. makes J.K. Rowling a mass murderer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. The same goes for Ray Fiennes when he played Amon Gerth in Schindler's List. Yeah. Wow. This goes or, on. I mean, so he I, also I played the crazy guy in... Uh, is Australia. Yeah. Yeah, Ray, Ray <laughs> Fiennes also played the crazy guy in Silence of the Lambs, and, didn't he? And he's Voldemort. Uh, oh, yes, uh, yeah. of course. Sounds of the Lambs, wasn't that Anthony Hopkins? That was Hopkins, yeah. Yes, but the Hopkins didn't kill anybody in the movie. They were trying to stop Ray Fiennes. No, from, no, 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 no. Uh, he, he was the puts the lotion on the skin guy. No, no, that was um, a different guy, but not Ray Fiennes. Oh, okay. I, th I, yeah. I think the real Voldemort is concerned no, that they, they portrayed him as too compassionate in the movies. No. But anyway, anyway. The, the, they, uh, they were like, <laughs> the rationale, if you can call it that, was to discourage real child abuse, but Homer commits child abuse every time he strangles Bart in that instance. Yeah. So they're latching on essentially to fiction and yeah. fantasies and video games and cartoons and yeah. thinking that if we stamp this kind of thing out, uh, it will somehow improve things in real life, and that strikes yeah, me as I, being incredibly yeah. delusional and I, ridiculous. I, I, but I, welcome I, to censorship. Yeah. Censorship is not sensible, right? I mean, the whole uh, philosophy behind censorship yeah. is we have to protect you from yourself. We know better than you do what's good for you and what's not. Yeah, and and uh, there's and sort of an innate arrogance they, they in that. They can't raise tax funds to fight these problems that they claim are caused by what they ban. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the thing to do is just to uh, get out there and, and be active, and uh, w when you see legislators doing ridiculous things like this in your country, uh, do whatever it is you're able to do, stand up, speak out, you know, uh, go, to, go to public hearings if they have them, and give your opinion of why it's absurd, and, you know, uh, sort of, you know, do the consciousness raising thing, as Dawkins puts it, you know, raise consciousness yeah, about these ideas. Speaking of which, I wish Mr. Stuff's FSM in the background would have said something, but oh well, you can't have everything <laughs> your no, way. Uh, and my my theory of my activism is to use the Ted Haggard effect. I'm going to send censors and as many people. I 
Melissa. TMI, dude. All right. I think we need to move on. Yeah. Hey, but All listen, right. we appreciate talking to you. Lots of fun. Thanks. We got to get online Great. with Richard next. All right. Thanks. Take care. Yeah. Richard in Manassas, you're on next. Richard? Uh, just a minute. We don't have... Do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, you handed chirp, us the name. Chirp, so. chirp. Okay, gotcha. right. We have to actually call out to the person and they have to answer. In the meantime... Oh, I'm, so, I'm going, still... Oh, never mind. Richard. Yes. Are I'm you there? Hi. 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 I'm on the air? Yes. You are on the air. We can hear oh, you great. Okay. Hi. How are you? Uh, you're on the intertubes, actually. <laughs> intertubes. Oh, this is awesome. Hey, I, I wanted to say, first of all, I think, as far as I know, you're the first atheists I've spoken to that I knew were atheists anyway. Ah. Okay. It's so I take it you're not an atheist, or you don't I, talk to oh, yourself? Oh, I definitely am an atheist, but oh, okay. I'm surrounded. Um, uh-huh. You know, family and community, and so I, I feel like a little island of sanity in the middle we're of We're delighted to be here for you, Richard. What's on your mind? Thank you. Okay. Um... <laughs> I am I'm certain of my atheism. Let's get that started. But I'm not sure it's the greatest idea for society. And I'll, I'm trying to walk you through this. Um, as we've gone off and we've discovered all these tribes and primitive peoples in America, uh, not America, in the world in general, um, we always find they have some supernatural beliefs, rituals, some sort of superstitions involved. And, and that seems to me to say that that religiosity is, is something innate in humans, is something we're built with. And if it's preserved like that, that makes me think that it's, it's, it has some sort of evolutionary benefit. And I don't know exactly what that is, but I think we need to figure it out. Ah, um, uh, well, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're like, ah. Uh. <laughs> no, no, Go ahead, no. step on each other. That's fine. <laughs> No. Uh, well, I was simply going to make the point that I, um, yeah, you're not the first guy to uh, have observed this, and and uh, it's uh, widely discussed. I would tend to put it this way. Okay. I think that being social beings, a sense of community is very important to us. Agreed. In the history of civilization and human culture. I think the earliest examples of community forming in this way, and especially community forming under a recognizable leadership that people could look up to, that would hand us, you know, good rules to live by, and uh, and that sort of thing, and you know, right. who would be perhaps maybe you know, paternal figures in the tribe or what have you. Well, this tended to go hand in hand with the development of religion in early culture, right? Yeah, uh, you know, and, and, and that was very important because right. you know, you're competing with neighboring tribes for resources, right. so the, the, the stronger society is going to win out in that case, right. and it means that, actually that's my basis for morality if you ask yeah. me. It's, that's where morality came from. Well, the, the stronger society no, has the better yeah. morals and will compete better. It doesn't mean they're killing off the neighbors, it means they're just better at They're better to, yeah. they're better no, able to work together. Yeah. Um, there, there are a couple of things, though. First of all, there was actually a study that I ran into this morning while printing stuff and then sadly rejected, so I can't read it to you. But Aww. it was just within the last few years that this study came out, which was basically analyzing uh, the religiosity level of different countries and their... Um, I don't know, some metric of morality, maybe violent crime or something like that. And what they found was that level of religiosity was actually inversely correlated to whatever standard of amorality they were using. Um, So, I mean, you've got like a very a-religious country like, I don't know, uh, uh, Iceland, I think, was one of the least. Uh, uh, Norway uh, or is Norway? That the that's one? the one. Yeah, I okay. think I think Norway is the least religious country um, in the West. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. has like the hu- one of the highest standards of living and the highest rates of happiness, or or something to that effect. I hate doing this blind. Uh, I should uh, have printed this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I, I think their surrogate for religion is is uh, socialism. The kind of no, plays all the roles that are religious. Um, no, because they filter oh. out effects like that. Oh, well, all right. Uh, but I think that uh, it's it's more the community. I mean, you know, when when you uh, if you look at religion today in America, for example, right, and uh, right. you see there's the, lots of 
And, and but, but you know, you look at the way churches are structured, right? There are these, there's, mm-hmm. and especially the bigger churches, where um, you know, what do you do at a church? Well, you, they essentially form a little community within the community. That's and that's s- it. They're social yeah. groups, yeah. Right, and so you have that. Um, and you have little fellowship groups, and the, the you know, this is that or the other meeting, and then of course you have the huge sanctuary that everyone gets together in, and then it, oh, it yeah. provides not just worship service on Sunday, but the church has really pr- tried to provide this sort of year-round, 24-7, you know, one-stop shop for all of your, you know, just innate social human needs, right? So you have that's this. That's absolutely true, and yeah. and that's not such a bad thing. If you that's not me. such a bad thing, but I yeah. think that that kind of it's you know the religion. That can be, that was done, that sort of evolved, evolved, at the same time, uh, you know, the, the, the need... For, it did evolve, yeah. Yeah. It, the, the, the need for that sense of community was there first, I think. Right. It happened yeah. to coexist with the development and evolution yeah, of religion. Yeah, but religion also has a bunch of extra yeah. baggage, which is not necessarily use, I mean, which is not necessarily beneficial to the hosts, yeah. the people who are carrying the religious beliefs. But well, it evolution is beneficial. doesn't always give you just what you need and take away all the stuff. Yeah, you need. but yeah. evolution yeah. also uh, comes up with thing with things like parasites, mm-hmm. and yes. one of the things that um, I, I mean, you know, one of the concepts. A lot of people talk about religion as a meme, which is sort of like a mind virus. Right. I, I mean, <laughs> if you think about a virus evolving, it doesn't make any sense to say. Well, humans are carriers of the flu virus, and so therefore uh, the flu virus must have some sort of benefit to us. That would be kind of missing the point. The flu virus evolved because the flu virus has learned to use a human body in a, in a right. maximally efficient way to keep reproducing itself. But that doesn't mean exactly. that having the flu is good for people. You, you no, follow what I'm saying? But That's yeah, absolutely true. But having... A good sense of community yeah. is good for sure. People. That, that is part so of religion need is good. I, yeah. I was really disappointed. I, 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 I sat down and watched pretty much every tape I could from the Beyond Belief forums that they had. A couple uh, they've had a couple of them. They had one in two thousand six and one okay. in two thousand seven. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you remember those? Uh, yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. And one of the subtitles of their forum was, "If not religion, then what?" And unfortunately, that's the one thing they didn't discuss. They had all kinds of topics about, well, why are people like this? We're absolutely sure there's no God, and this is why we know, and this is why we know, and aren't we great for knowing? But they didn't come up with any alternatives, and that infuriated yeah, me, too. Yeah, but what's the alternative to something. the flu virus? Well, the alternative is not virus, having the flu. What's the alternative to having community? Well, not having community. Well, I, okay, yeah. there is I've an kind alternative of got that to now, community. Let me you tell you guys, f- it kind of sucks. You yeah. should <laughs> form groups like the atheist community of Austin. You should join us for dinner if you're in Austin after the show at Pluckers, <laughs> yeah. and you should <laughs> go out of your way to yeah. come yeah. to Austin but let me, for the man. Bat Cruise yeah. on September 26th. But let me try to address this point a little bit more directly. Okay. Uh, what do, what do you? Because I, I know what you're getting at, really, and. Um, with religion, because it has been with us for so very long, right? Uh, the structure's there, right? The structure Absolutely. for that, f- the structure for that sense of community, which is all important, is there. And yeah. I think that even with the supernatural belief and the baggage that religion is trying to sell, I think that if you were to, you know, really kind of question the people who who partake in all of this, you know, they'll tell you that when you get right down to it, it is the sense of community that they get out of it. Perhaps even more so in most cases than the God belief, or the uh, and uh, you know I, I always surprise a lot of people as much as I'm a hardline atheist by telling them you know all my memories of you know being an adolescent and growing up in church and doing youth activities and stuff are all pleasant, right? So yes. even I am willing to acknowledge the the value of the the, the community. Um, so why religion perpetuates uh, is because it's the machinery is in place, right? Right. You know, to, yeah. to, to provide that sense of community. And atheism, f- more or less being fairly new in the cultural you know, landscape, as it were. I mean, there have always been people back to antiquity who haven't believed in God or gods, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. But uh, in the West, especially, and in modern times, it's only been within the last hundred or couple hundred years that a person, in, you know, European or whoever, you know, whatever have you, you, oh. you can, could come out and say, why well, don't believe in God, and I think the Bible is a load of rubbish, and and so there you are. It's, and not it's only be, been like three generations we've had any kind of secular nations, anyway. right? It's and and not face blasphemy laws, right? Oh, like yeah. not be thrown in prison 
for saying I don't believe in God. And they're even still trying to do that today in, in Ireland. Ireland. I, I yeah. think... Blast, you know, it, so it's, it's been, a, it's a new phenomenon, and atheism and non-belief hasn't had the time to put that s uh, community structure together. You want to consider like, also that your, that your bias, that your um, perception might be a little skewed based on the fact that, like you said at the beginning of this call, you are actually in a place where you don't, aren't aware of any uh, atheists, of any other atheists that you've talked to. If yeah. you come from that kind of environment, of course you're going to come away with sort of a feeling that the only way you can get any sort of community or or um, communal well-being, I, I mean, you know, striving towards common goals, is to impose this artificial uh, fake belief in an invisible man in the sky. Um, I but I mean, you know, from my different perspective as a guy who grew up in an atheist family i've never felt that atheists that that theism particularly provides something that i was fundamentally lacking in any way but his circumstance is the more common circumstance of, of everyone in our yeah. country yeah and what we've got going on in here with austin with the aca and, and what have you is you know it's it's an emergent phenomenon you know atheists are going wow there's atheists on tv and there's an atheist club and there's all these atheist sites on the web i can visit it's it's a new discovery <laughs> to a lot aren't of people saying wow i'll bet well right <laughs> well, well well the atheists who oh are oh my god yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what they're saying um so right. so yeah um the uh so right the 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 community aspect of religion is is an absolutely great benefit and i uh, and i believe that it is the number one reason why religion continues to perpetuate that and i think in some ways the, the bel religious beliefs the supernatural beliefs do you know help people manage basic insecurities in life whether or not they're they getting the so right answer you know <laughs> the idea of you know well maybe there's a heaven to go to kind of makes death a little less scary sometimes. well yeah you know what i'd love but, to believe in an afterlife because i don't really want to die i'll take that you know eternal life yeah. i'd be happy with that if, yeah i tell people you know afterlife I'm, offer. I'm all for it right but yeah. you know and you just need a little more in the way of evidence yeah, for so yeah. not so much yeah. not so much with the being tortured for everything yeah i mean no no you no, know, no if that's no. the alternative Forever i'm paradise, fine with that's, dying that's my yeah, but uh, but you bring up some really great points, and uh, we're we're happy to hear from you. And we're coming down the last couple minutes, so yeah. we should probably. I see that, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, we're in the last oh. thirty seconds, and goodbye, everybody. I'd like to uh, thank all the incredibly brilliant tech savvy people who tune in despite our lack of real TV. Uh, and I'd this like is real to TV for the 21st the, century, the man. Very hardworking people who surround us in this very room right now, who you can't see, but you could if you were coming to Pluggers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you, Martin, for uh, thank another you. really fun show. I always have a good time with you. Oh, me prattling on, I know. All right. See you later, everyone. Bye. Visit the blog. So